Hey, South Hills Church, happy Palm Sunday. If you're wondering what that is and why we celebrate it, you're not alone. Before we get to Easter, we take time to celebrate and remember Jesus' final arrival into Jerusalem. Jesus was coming to celebrate the Jewish holiday called the Passover. He entered into the city on a donkey and people laid out palm branches and even the coats off their back as he rode by. They shouted praises like Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And at the time, most of these people didn't even understand that Jesus was about to change history forever. They expected him to overthrow the Roman Empire and physically rule Israel. And one week later, when he sacrificed his life for their sin and ours, they were confused and distraught. Today, we have the beauty of seeing the full picture, his joyous entrance, his sacrificial death, and the triumph of the resurrection. This week, I recommend you take some time to read the stories of Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter. For the story of Palm Sunday, I recommend you read Matthew chapter 21. For the story of Good Friday, I recommend you read Matthew 26 and 27. And for the Easter story, I recommend you read Matthew chapter 28. As we prepare our hearts to celebrate all that God has done for us through his death and resurrection, think about who can you invite to join you at church this Easter Sunday? Who in your life needs to hear this story? Don't miss the opportunity to extend that invitation and allow someone to experience the power of God. see you guys. Thank you so much for joining us here on Palm Sunday. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to have you and more excited to be kicking off Holy Week today uh, with Palm Sunday followed by Good Friday and then eventually Easter next Sunday. And so today um, we're going to sort of do a standalone message, just unpacking what Palm Sunday is and its significance in our Christian calendar, why it's such a big deal, why we bring it up, and what in the world it has to do with our lives today. And so uh, I want to encourage you to take some notes today, write down some things that stand out to you that maybe make you want to talk about them more, think about them more, maybe discuss them over lunch today. And uh, for those of you that are taking notes, the title of my message today is, How Do You End Up at the Parade? How do you end up at the parade? Um, I'm not uh, huge into sports, uh, just a confession, I guess. Uh, I do love the Lakers. I watch the Lakers uh, religiously, but pr pretty much all other sports, when people ask me, like, what's your football team? What's your hockey team? I'm like, I don't have, what do you like? Uh, I, I don't know. I, that's not really a thing for me, but I, I do come from the Midwest. All my family is from Missouri, and so they are all massive football fans, and specifically, they're massive Chiefs fans. They love it. They're all about it. Like, like, the, the, like, think of the craziest, most chaotic, most out there fans who are like shirtless, painted bodies, going crazy, right? Um, like, these are the types of people that my extended family is. And some of you are like, that's why you moved out here, and uh, maybe partially. Um, but what happened was when they won the Super Bowl, of course, my family's going crazy. They're going nuts. And they all were like, man, we, we want to try and figure out how we can get to the parade, and I didn't even know that that was a thing. I'll just be honest with you guys. I did not know that there was a parade after, like, when your team wins something big and they bring the trophy back, then uh, there's a massive parade. And so they really wanted to go. And thousands of people, if you've never seen this, line the streets and they're all celebrating. They're all going crazy. They're all a little bit drunk. And... <laughs> Again, maybe another reason my family wanted to go, um, including the people, athletes writing, okay, uh, just toasting people, and uh, like just celebrating and going nuts. And I mean, it's interesting because you can tell when they pan into these people, because I watched some clips of this on YouTube, like you can tell it means a lot to these people. They're really all about it. They're, but like what, is, what stood out to me was for different reasons. Like there are different reasons that these people are at this parade and different reasons why this moment means a lot to them. And for somebody that maybe is not super into sports, like it was fascinating to me to like dig into that a little bit more. I remember watching this YouTube clip that was like interviews with people 
post parade and it was like all of the stuff sort of had settled all the confetti was being swept up and uh, they, there were journalists that were just interviewing people as to like why they were there and one guy was saying that the reason why he was there is because he grew up in a really poor really abusive family and for him football was an escape from all that like when he played football, it was sort of a reminder that like there was more to life than just this really chaotic home environment. And it was, he was good at it. And his team was the Chiefs. And like the fact that they were winning now was a big deal to him. There was this other guy who said that uh, his dad wasn't very affectionate, um, but there was like one thing they really bonded over and it was, it was football. And specifically, the Chiefs was their team. And his dad had rooted for the Chiefs to win a Super Bowl his whole entire life, and he died uh, the year before they won the Super Bowl a few years ago. And he, this guy was there with his son that his dad had never met. And he was like, I'm here to honor my dad. And the guy was like tearing up while he was talking. And again, I'm not really a football guy, but I was like, it got me, you know what I mean? There was this other woman that they interviewed, and she said that when she was a kid, she looked like she was probably like in her mid-40s. She said that when she was a kid, that there was a Chiefs player who uh, was sort of from the area that she was from and who came back into the neighborhood and pumped money into a couple local businesses. And it was a really, really like, um, you know, poverty sort of stricken area. And because of the investment that this guy had made, her single mom got a job at one of those businesses and actually provided for the family. And she's just like, it was funny watching her on camera because she was just like, I don't know anything about football, but I love this team. It's the best day of my life. <laughs> and it was just incredible watching all these interviews and watching these people celebrate. And this thing that really didn't seem that important to me before now seemed very important to me once I had sort of the backstory, the context of what was going on. And once I heard all these reasons, and what fascinated me so much was, the, the reasons that people were at this giant football parade, very few of them had anything to do with football, which sort of fascinated me. And on the surface, right, yeah, you can look at something like this, at least for me, and it looked like just a bunch of people wearing red and, you know, drinking beer and cheering for grown men who play games for a living, okay? It can seem a little silly, right? It can seem a little foolish when you break it down logically. But when you dig behind the surface, what it made me realize is that there is always a story behind the story. Right? There are situations and conversations that lead anyone to do anything, that lead these specific someones to do this specific something. And I think this is true of everything that happens in all of our lives, including the things that happen in Scripture that seem sort of incredible and out there. Like, why would people do this? Why would they react this way? And I want to just dig into this as we are looking into today's topic, as we're examining this idea of Palm Sunday, because this story really revolves also around a massive epic parade. And I want to just read to you one of the accounts of this. There's uh, four biographies of Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, Mark is very, like, action-packed. And, uh, and so I'm going to read to you from this because it just feels like it fits the football theme. Okay, so... Mark chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, Jesus sent two of them uh, on ahead. Go to that village, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll return it soon. Now, this is funny to me for a lot. Of, like, imagine this being imported into our day and age. Like, me just, like, going into a new city where we're going to put a, a South Hills, you know, and I'm there with Moses. And uh, I'm like, okay, before we go into the city, I send a couple of my staff members. I'm like, go into the town, okay? The first Tesla you see <laughs> just sitting there looks brand new. And, like, no one's ever driven it. Just take it. Just get in it and just drive it straight here. And if anybody questions you, you just say, Pastor Moses needs it. It will be returned shortly. <laughs> like, there's a lot of things in the Bible that when you update them, into our, you're like, Whoa, what's happening? And it, really what it reveals to us is that, like, uh, the Lord needs it is like a secret code. Like, Jesus has been to this city uh, several times before, and uh, he probably knows the people that are there, and he told them that he was coming. And he, he had sort of planned out this day is what we're getting a glimpse in, that this wasn't random. 
that this, this particular donkey was set aside for him. It goes on to say this in verse 7, that they brought the colt to Jesus and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches that they'd cut from the fields. And Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom. Now I want to sort of unpack what's, what's happening here. Um, as Moses said in, uh, in the senior pastor spotlight this week, this story takes place over Passover, which is a, a festival, uh, one of the, the pilgrimage festivals where devout Jews during this time in history would travel to Jerusalem for a feast, this big ritualistic meal. And this particular tradition was commemorating and celebrating that God had freed the Israelites or the, uh, the Israelite people from the Egyptians. But it really, it wasn't just about looking back. It was, it had this component of sort of celebrating this and also looking forward because these people believed that one day uh, God would send a divine leader. They called this leader the Messiah. And it would be both a, a spiritual and maybe even a political leader who would rise up and who would deliver not just their people, but all people everywhere from every imaginable sort of oppression. It was a big deal. So there's this sense of anticipation for this to come. And specifically for these people because they were currently occupied by the Romans. And so it was a big deal. And so all these people were in the city. But for some reason, this huge crowd starts to gather around a certain road. And they're hoping to get a glimpse of a man named Jesus. And this sort of parade is forming, but no parade is happening. Which doesn't surprise you if you've ever been to a parade. Everyone gets there like seven hours early, right? And they're all camped out, and there's this anticipation, and the crowd keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and people are trying to get closer and closer and closer. And it's this, this, this sort of tension of, like, something uh, incredible is about to happen, which I think brings up for me, what is the story behind the story? Like, how do we get to this point? Why would all these people show up in this particular place? Like, I mean, how did this happen? How do they even know who Jesus is? Like, why, why did they get to this place in their own lives where they came to believe in someone that they probably had never met before to the extent that they would line the streets and wait maybe for hours on end for this giant parade and then shout to this person to save them? I mean, that seems pretty incredible. And when we look back at it, like we, we know like the rest of the story in the context, but pretend that you don't have like the rest of the Bible. It just seems like sort of a, an odd moment. And yet if we flip back through the chapters preceding, we get a glimpse of why these people are there. And I want to just sort of give you a, a quick like highlight overview of some of like some things that happened prior in the book of Mark. And there's a lot of things because he just packs a lot of action into a very little space, okay? So we're just going to read these very quickly. I'm going to read from the message translation. You get this sense that a lot of people are telling a lot of other people about experiences with Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verse 27 says this, everyone uh, there was skeptical, buzzing with curiosity. What's going on here? A new teaching that does what it says? Like, in other words, a, a preacher that's actually honest, which is kind of a sad thing that we're like, yeah, we know those people too. Um, Jesus shuts up defiling spirits and sends them packing. News of this traveled fast and was soon all over Galilee. Mark chapter 1, verse 45. As soon as the man was out of earshot, this man that Jesus healed, he told everyone he met what happened, spreading the news all over town. Jesus kept to the out-of-the-way places, no longer able to move freely, but people still found him. And came from all over. Mark chapter 3 verse 7. Jesus went with his disciples to the sea to get away. But a huge crowd trailed after him. Swarms of people who had heard the reports. And come to see for themselves. Everyone who had something wrong was pushing and shoving to get near to Jesus. Mark chapter 5 verse 14. Those who saw what happened bolted and told their story in town and country. Everyone wanted to see what had happened, and so they came up to Jesus. Mark chapter 5, verse 18. As Jesus was leaving, the man he healed begged to go with him. But Jesus said, go home to your people. Tell them your story. He went back and began to preach about what Jesus had done for him. He was the talk 
of the town. Mark chapter 6, verse 14. King Herod heard all this because by this time the name of Jesus was on everyone's lips. Mark chapter 7, verse 36. Jesus urged them to keep quiet, but they talked it up all the more beside themselves with excitement. And this is just like a handful of examples. So we're like, that feels like a lot. That feels like a lot of the Bible that we just read. But what I want to illustrate to you is that the reason that so many in this community knew who Jesus was and believed that he might be able to heal their brokenness and found out exactly where he was going to be and fought through these really thick crowds and waited for hours on end for him to ride by. The reason so many people showed up with a sense of expectation was, wait for this, someone invited them. It's crazy, huh? And maybe you're thinking like, well, of course they did. These people had seen Jesus do miracles. And so if I would have seen that, I would sell a lot of people to go to the parade too. But like I haven't seen any miracles up close. That'd be great. I haven't seen any great miracles up close. And I just want to challenge that assumption. Haven't you though? Like maybe you've not seen somebody be brought back to life at a funeral. I'm not even sure I want to, okay? Uh, I feel like that would just be more freaky than, than exciting. Maybe you've never seen someone who had been crippled for their whole life stand up and begin to walk again. But I would imagine that you've probably, if you've been a Jesus follower for any amount of time or coming to church for any amount of time, that you've probably seen someone that was deeply and desperately addicted to something that Jesus freed from that addiction. You've probably seen someone who was super shy and lonely come to find, maybe for the first time in their life, really deep friendships in this faith community. Maybe you've seen like uh, an, an atheistic coworker who, because you just kept like mentioning things about it and sharing things on Facebook, they actually came with you to church at one point and they were just like, this is interesting and amusing. I don't know what I think about it, but I'm having a good time here. And they keep coming over and over and over again, even though they don't even know if they believe in any of what's happening here. They feel like somehow they fit. Those are miracles. And sometimes we don't give them credit for being what they really are. Stories of people stuck in a limited way of thinking and being and living who found a new kind of life in Jesus through this church, through this spiritual community. And I think in the same way that the people inside of Scripture, in the book of Mark here, felt compelled to share what they'd seen and heard and experienced with the people around them, I think that you and I, we have an obligation to share what we've seen and heard and experienced with the people around us. In fact, this is a huge deal. So much so that like so many voices in Scripture keep echoing this idea over and over again. This is one of the most pointed ways that the Apostle Paul says it in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10, verse 13, he says this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? I love Paul because he's so incredibly logical. He's just like, isn't this great news? And everyone's like, yeah, amen. And he's like, okay, but hold on for a second. How is this really going to work? Right? Unless for them, for them to reach out to Jesus for help, they got to know who he is. They got to believe in him. They, they have to understand, like, like, kind of the principle that Jesus has this ability, this power. And why would they know any of that stuff? Because someone would have to, like, tell them about it. Someone would have to talk to them and invite them and bring them along with them. And this makes logical sense. But if you're like me, if I'm really honest, my hope is that that someone will be someone else. Like, I agree with you, Paul. How would they know unless someone tells them? Who's it going to be? You know, who is going to tell this person uh, about who Jesus is and how powerful he is and how he can change their life? And meanwhile, you're looking around and everyone's looking at you being like, lady, it's your husband. Maybe you should extend an invite. <laughs> it's your neighbor. We don't live in that neighborhood. Okay? It's your coworker. 
It would be creepy if I busted up in your office. I don't even have a, a key code for the door. But you have permission to come and go freely. It seems like a job for you. And this is the question that I want to just bring up in your mind. What if God gave you the assignment to tell the people around you where and how to find him? I mean, could that be the, the greater reason why you live where you live and you work where you work and you go to the gym that you go to? We have this core value here at South Hills that we talk about uh, in Discover. It's one of the things that we plan and base all of what we do on. And it says this, we won't wait for someone else to reach our neighbors. And essentially what this means is that like, we really do think you are where you are for a reason. That our job as a, as a church or as a staff is to provide you with opportunities and inspiration and invites to, to basically tell your story and bring other people around you in on what God is doing here. There's a churchy word for this. You've probably heard it before. It's called evangelism, okay? And we have a lot of baggage with this word, but essentially it just means this. The act of bringing people in on good news. And the person who has these sorts of conversations with people is called an evangelist, an enthusiastic advocate. <laughs> now, some of you are like, I get this. I know what it is. Because those, those two sentences that I gave you, that's not what pops into your head when you think about it. Oh, just like somebody bringing people on in good news. Just somebody who's an advocate for something. That's great. You think of somebody like this, right? But it's really in the context of where this word came from and what it actually means, it doesn't mean this. It really means something more like this. <laughs> evangelists. What you're watching every time the camera cuts to these people in a game, you are seeing evangelism in progress. <laughs> Enthusiastic advocates trying to bring people in on the good news of their team. And now my family is going to, like, write me be and call me because they're like, why don't you use a picture of us? Um, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if you guys want to be out there like that. Um, I think a lot of times we overcomplicate things. We, we think we need to have everything all figured out. We think we need to know more theology. And we need to be able to explain certain, you know, answer certain biblical questions that are really complex that we don't understand. Um, but really, at its core, evangelism is really just this. Someone uh, who has an experience shares their experience, and invites someone else to have their own experience. That's it. Now you think about all these people that are massive advocates for whatever their team is. They're just like, I love it. It's so great. you got to come to the game. It's so amazing. Oh, why wouldn't you? It's just, you know what? Just come. Just check it out. Just check it out, okay? Just come. My mom makes the best nacho. Just come over. Just sit with it. I will buy you a jersey myself. Just come. You just got to be in the crowd. I'm just telling you, you just need to, oh, you don't have to. But I'm just saying it would be great if you did. That's essentially it. And, I mean, isn't this the reason that anybody gets into anything? This thing right here, this description right here. Whether you're talking about taco joints or ice cream flavors or Netflix shows or even, you know, Passover parades. It's all the same. Somebody who has an experience shares that experience and invites somebody else to have their own experience. And this is what human community has always been built upon is this sort of thing right here. And if they're anything like my friends, you know, you ask them, and then you ask them again, and then you remind them like seven times, and then you send them the link, and then you tell them again, and they're like, oh, I didn't get a link. And you're like, yeah, I sent you a link last May. And then they still didn't get it, and then you give it, and then you send it to them, and then they're like, oh my gosh, I love this. This is amazing. Why didn't you tell me about this sooner? And you're like, are you serious right now? <laughs> because I told you about this seven months ago, and I have the text documentation <laughs> to prove it in the thread. I will go to a court of law with you and pull out these documents. It's really as easy as this. this. This to me is evangelism. This is something I like. I'd like you to check it out because I think there's a chance you might like it too. I think if you're honest with yourself, you have overcomplicated this significantly. This is all it is. This is something I like. I would like for you to check it out because I think it's something that you might like too. It blows my mind that, um, like, we can run these reports of, like, when, pe when people come for the first time, they tell us, like, how they, they came here, how they heard about it. 
and the fascinating thing to me is that the person so far, like who has invited more people to our church that we can track here, is a junior high kid. <laughs> and I know them. They do not know a lot of theology. <laughs> they do not know how to answer a lot of complicated biblical questions. You know what they're doing? Hey, this is something I like. I would like for you to check it out because I think there's a chance you might like it too. And guess what? It has been working. And what happens in these people's lives is something way more profound than just coming and liking something. They come and find themselves being loved by a community, by God himself. They find themselves fitting in a place they never thought they could ever belong. And yet, the story that we're reading here of the people on the edge of this parade, they're not just hoping, you know, to eat something really good or be entertained by something. They have another expectation. They're showing up because they have this thought, this belief, this hope that the person they're about to see and meet in this parade may just be able to change everything for them, may be able to put them on a completely different path. It, it says in all of the accounts of this that they, they, they yell out this word, Hosanna, which, which literally means, please save us. Isn't it interesting, like, when, when we hear this word, a lot of times maybe growing up in church, it's like, Hosanna! And you're like, I don't know what they're, that, is that high five? It sounds like exciting. And really what it is, is it is a loud cry for help. Please save us. And the reason I bring this up is because I, I think people are still crying Hosanna. All around us. But most of us are not shouting it at God. We're whispering it to all sorts of other things without even realizing it. Think of the things that you are shouting Hosanna at, maybe not even consciously, but subconsciously. The things that you are grabbing hold of to try and save you. I think a lot of us shout this to like a new relationship or a new job or like a new pair of shoes, right? We're doing this thing, and on the surface it looks like this, but if you dug below the surface, what you'd realize, the story behind the surface, the, the story is that we're whispering like, save me. I need to get out of this state, this feeling, this part of my life, this stuckness, and I need to be pulled into something else, something new, something better. We say it to a good meal or a dream vacation or a big sale we stumble across. We're like, please save me. And we do it with all sincerity. It's not a joke to us because we all have this, this steady ache inside of us. I think we're all sort of like these people looking to a horizon for something that will appear and save us. I would say that everyone you know has a hidden desire to be saved from something. Everyone. Everyone. And I know you're starting to think about the people around you, and you're like, well, not everyone. Everyone. A little while ago, I had lunch with this guy from my gym, and we're, I mean, we're not very close. I see him at the gym. We do a lot of man nodding, like, mm, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, he spotted me a few times. I mean, that's, it's very, it's intimate. Uh, you know, if you're a guy, that's about as close as some friendships need to get, you know. Just, uh, you stood over me and sweated on me while I was trying to bench press something. And, um, but we've, we've had, like, uh, lunch a couple times, and um, we're just sort of friendly, but our relationship isn't, isn't deep or close by any means. And we were at lunch, and, and uh, he's the sort of guy, just so you know, who, I mean, he, he has the body that I'm at the gym trying to get and have never accomplished, okay? And this guy, he, he walked in. That was his beginner body, you know what I mean? It's, which just feels unfair. And he just always seems put together. He always seems smiling. He always just seems positive. He just seems like the kind of guy every other guy wants to be. And so we're sitting down at lunch at this, like, Hawaiian barbecue place, and we're eating. And I'm just like, so, like, I, yeah, I mean, like, tell me about, I don't know you a lot outside the gym. Like, how is everything? Like, what's, you know, how's your life? And he's like, yeah, pretty good. And, like, almost as a joke, I was just like, really? But he didn't take it as a joke. And his smile, like, faded from his face. And he started tearing up a little bit. And it was like, I don't know if you've had this moment where the, the mood shifts really suddenly. And you're trying to, like, catch up with it. And he looked down at his plate and back up at me. And he said, 
I don't really like my life. I remember feeling really sick to my stomach and, and realizing that I had misjudged a lot about this guy, that I'd seen everything on the surface and never considered everything that could be going on beneath. I never even thought about the story behind the story because the facade was enough to fake me out. Everyone, you know, has a deep desire to be saved from something. What the people in this parade are chanting is actually something that they stole from somewhere else. It's from Psalm 118, a song that, that someone who is really desperate to be freed and saved from something wrote a few thousand years prior. It was a, a heart cry for help that people would sing over and over again to themselves or as a group in certain seasons when life felt particularly desperate. And it felt just as relevant as the day it was written on the day that these people were lining the streets in Jerusalem, singing it, shouting it at Jesus. And I think if you listen closely enough, I bet you could hear its muffled melody being whispered and seeping out the windows of the houses on your street if you're paying attention. You know, life wasn't really great for these people during this time. They were just sort of eking by. The, the Roman government had pretty much broken their spirits and stolen their hope. And you could look at that and be like, of course, like, you know, you would, you would invite someone to a parade to see someone who claimed to be able to save you from your stuckness. But it really wasn't that simple. To invite someone to this parade, in this environment, in this culture, on this day, was a really dangerous invite because of what it insinuated, because of what it would likely lead to. Because here's the thing that you may not know that history makes very clear. This was not the only parade that day. In fact, the reality is, as Jesus was entering Jerusalem at the East Gate with his followers, Pilate... A Roman leader was entering the West Gate with his soldiers. And each of them were making their triumphal entry, which is, it gets lost on us. We think it's a Bible thing, but honestly what it is, it's, it's a Roman thing. It's a military parade revolving around a conquering commander celebrating a victory. And, and yet these two figures coming in on opposite ends of the city, represented two very different kingdoms and two very different philosophies of life. Pilate, he stood for force and domination and violence and control. And Jesus, he represented love and humility and sacrifice and service. And both of these men are entering into the city, one at the front gate, Pilate, and one at the back gate, Jesus, which is in a lot of ways symbolism for the fact that like God's kingdom sneaks in the back door. Like we're waiting for it to mow us over through the front gate. And what Jesus is telling people like in a very specific way is like you're looking in the wrong direction. God's kingdom in many ways sneaks up on us when we least expect it from the direction that we weren't even looking in. And Jesus designed this this way that these two kingdoms would come to a clash. This is why he was able to, in other, where, other places in the Gospels, predict that the Son of Man will die because he understood what this sort of parade meant. In fact, the use of palm branches was a nod to a revolt that happened 150 years earlier when Judas Maccabeus led the people in a victory over their past oppressors. And so these people are grabbing palm branches, not because it's just what was available. They're grabbing palm branches because they're like, do to Rome what Judas Maccabeus did to the past dynasty that held us down and held us under. Free us. Rise up and revolt. They, they really, they wanted Jesus, despite everything they knew about him, they wanted him to claim a victory the same way Rome did, with bloodshed. And Jesus was going to claim a victory with bloodshed. It was just that that blood was going to be his own. It was going to be a different kind of victory. 
Everyone knew that crowds hailing a new hero like this would be seen as a threat to the Roman government. Like, so Jesus being at the center of a parade like this was likely to get him killed. And being at a parade like this yourself or inviting someone to a parade like this or being overheard inviting someone to a parade like this was likely to get you killed. Now, we're not like in the same danger today, right? Like you invite someone to Easter and people are like, what did you do? Kill him. Kill him. That's not really the sort of situation we're in. But that doesn't mean it doesn't come with a cost, right? There's a real cost um, of inviting someone in on the thing that we think God is doing where we think he's doing it. People might label you a religious nut. People might assume that, you know, since you go to church and call yourself a Christian, that you have a particular political point of view that maybe you don't share, right? Um, they might assume or associate your church with another church uh, that gave them a really bad, negative, horrible, oppressive, judgmental experience that you're like, that's not anything like my church. They may associate you now that you've outed yourself as a Christian with other Christians that they don't like, that they've made fun of in front of you. And nobody wants to be misunderstood, misjudged, mislabeled, or marginalized by their friends, family, and coworkers. We don't want that. That is costly. And so the question comes up for me, like, what would make a risk like that worth it? Like, for them then and for us now. And what I think is, you're willing to risk rejection and invite someone new when what you're inviting them to saved you. And I think that's what's happening to these people then. But I think if you refresh your memory, it, it might change the way that you talk to people now. When you look at your connection with Christ and maybe your connection to this community and you recognize that it helped you tunnel out of a really dark depression or it, it was key in helping you salvage your really broken beyond belief marriage or it helped you not feel so alone for the first time in your life about certain things that you'd been through. Maybe it helped you finally kick an addiction you thought you'd never get on top of. And when you reminisce on that, it changes the way you feel about bringing people in on it. Because I'm not just telling you about something you might enjoy. I'm telling you it saved me because I think it might be able to save you too. Remembering what you were rescued from inspires you to be a rescuer. And this is what I want you to think about as we go into the Easter season. This is part of the reason why Passover was constructed in the way it was. It was about looking back and then looking forward. Because when you look back and remember what you've been through and what God saved you from, it inspires you to take the next right step in front of you for the sake of somebody else. And you don't reach out in a confrontational, condescending, judgmental way. You reach out from a loving, hopeful, encouraging way because you just want them to experience what you experienced. And that's enormously effective. The, the reality of it is, you know, personal stories open people up to new possibilities. There are things that we don't like or agree with in theory, but then when we know a real person who's experienced it and it's revolutionized their life, that shades it differently. When someone you know has a personal experience that enables them to change something about them that nobody around them thought would ever change about them, you want to know how. Because maybe what, what worked for you could work for me too. And I think that's why so many people made the extra effort to invite others to stand on the edge of a Jesus parade this day. And not all of those people that were invited ended up becoming Jesus followers. At least not right away. But some of them did. For some of them, that invitation changed everything because this is how it works. And I would argue you already know this. Every significant experience you've had is the result of a simple invitation you got. Think of the moments that changed your life. If you were to actually flip back through the chapters preceding, it was just a single simple invitation, wasn't it? You got to come meet this girl. I don't want to be set up with your friend. No, I'm telling you, just come and hang out. And now you're like, we have been married for 30 years. So glad they invited me to that party. Just come check out this school. Just come to this meeting with me. Just come spend a couple of days with my family. 
Come on, let's just try this class just one time together. And it transformed everything about you. And this right here is the reason that I want you to invite as many people as you possibly can to experience Easter with you. And why would they come? I think they would come because, you know, they care about you and you care about this. When the people that are close to us are like, I really like this, it would mean a lot to me. You're like, sounds dumb, but I like you, so I'll check it out, right? Maybe they would come because they've seen a significant shift in you, and when you, realize, when you reveal to them that that shift has come from what you've experienced here, that may change things for them. Maybe they come because you promised to buy them brunch afterwards. They're not all spiritual reasons, guys, okay? <laughs> Sometimes they're just practical. But here's my point. You ought to be the reason that someone ends up at the parade. You ought to be the reason that, that somebody showed up, that somebody was on the edge of the street, that somebody was on the edge of the crowd, that somebody had enough faith in that moment to reach out and say, please save me. Somebody, you, cared enough to notice and to know that everyone in their orbit is desperate to be saved from something. Because i got to tell you, a parade is always about more than the parade. It's, it's, it's about connection and inclusion and freedom and purpose. And the parade that we celebrate, the parade of Jesus coming back to life and then extending to us the power of his resurrection, that is a way more significant thing to gather and celebrate together than your favorite team winning a national championship that we claim is a world championship, even though we're the only country that plays for it. So here's what I want to end with us doing today. On each of your cards when you came in, there was a single Easter invite, and I hope that you take way more than just one, but I want you to hold this one, and, and I want you to think about maybe a specific person. Maybe as I've been talking today, you're like, man, I, I have a feeling that this is the person that I need to have a conversation with. I need to do more than invite them. I need to bring them. I need to actually pick them up and say, like, come on, let's go. You're coming with me. I need to, like, out myself as a Christian for the first time in my workplace to this person. I need to go, and I, not stealthily. I need to, like, actually put myself out there and show them with sincerity that I really want them to do this thing. I don't know who that person is for you, but I want you to think about one person in your mind. And I want you to set aside this invite. This invite more special, more significant, more set aside than any other invite. This one is for them. And today I want to close in prayer, not really praying for you as much as praying for them. That whatever thing they are desperate to be saved for, that because of your willingness to extend an invite, to have a Jesus conversation with them, that because of that, they get a chance at salvation. Would you, while holding on to your card, just bow your heads with me across this room. Fix that person in your mind. And let's pray. God, in this moment, we are grateful. Like the people at the original Palm Sunday, we, we look back and we are grateful for all that you've delivered us from, all that you've saved us from, all that we could not have crawled out of without you. Some of us, <laughs> we've lived this new life for so long, we forgot what it was like before you, before this place, before this church, before this community, before connection with you. And God, in this moment, we ask that that remembrance of being rescued would make us a rescuer. God, as we're picturing a lot of different people in our minds, maybe they're a coworker, a relative, a, a friend, a family member, that God, as, as we go throughout this week, may you give us the right moment. God, even give us the wrong moment. We don't care. We want an opportunity to invite them in on the thing that you've done in our lives of just saying, like, I really like this. And I really like for you to check it out because I think that you might like it too. In fact, I think that what you might find there 
will surprise you. I think it might change everything for you in ways that I don't know how to explain to you, but it would mean a lot to just come and see with me. I change lives because of the backstory of our conversations this Easter. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.